next time on Ding Dong Games. This is a special episode. This time I've been challenged by my haters to an even harder version of the hardcore Nuzlocke, the Ding Dong Lock, in Pokemon Renegade Platinum. Not for the faint of heart, it one of my absolute hardest challenges I've ever done to date. No gift Pokemon, level caps in place, substitute is banned, and no exploiting setup moves. Only the best of the best can pull off this Nuzlocke, but I'm gonna win, no matter what. And I won't just beat the main game, no, I'll beat the post game too to finally prove that I'm one of the best Nuzlockers. Let's go! I'm finally back to Renge Platinum, and what you're about to see is the craziest Nuzlocke I've ever performed, the Ding Dong Lock. Basically it's an extreme Nuzlocke with even more restrictions in place. Renegade Platinum does, to be honest, have a lot of abusable things in it despite its difficulty that can allow even unskilled players to completely cheese it without any effort. You know what I mean. First of all, level caps will be in place for all gym badges to prevent any overleveling. I also limit my overleveling for the other boss battles too. Next, all gift Pokemon, free Pokemon, and all static encounters are no longer allowed in this game at all, with the sole exception from your one starter that you get at the beginning of the game, and that's it. Look, as good as Renegade Platinum is, the fact that you literally get access to 16 gift Pokemon, all of which are extremely powerful, before the second gym, makes the game just so much easier and also makes it, especially the early game, not fun after several attempts as basically every playthrough becomes almost the exact same. The gift Pokemon, they're so good they over-centralize the game. Roark, for example, is always Marshtomp sweep, as Marshtomp is guaranteed at that point. Gardenia is always substitute sweep with a fire type, and so on. Also, all static encounters like Spiritomb and Rotom, and legendary Pokemon like Uxie and Celebi will also be disallowed. Now, in this run, there is no set strategy for each gym, no inherent way to cheese, and no guaranteed encounters. Everything has to be at least somewhat randomised. In this Ding Dong Lock, you have to scavenge strategies of the scraps that you catch. All Pokemon will have some level of randomness to them, as they all have to be wild encounters. There is no more set optimal win all plan anymore, which creates a lot of tension while also forcing you to be very creative, and also makes it a lot of fun and a breath of fresh air as Every Nuzlocke done this way will be very different as it's pretty random. This is genuinely fun as it adds challenge but also encourages replay value and strategic thinking. The next big restriction, and this is a really big one, is that in this run, TM Substitute is now banned. Look, I know it's great, but it really is too great in this game. The reality is, is that the move Substitute is incredibly broken as it literally breaks the game. Hell, people have complained about me using it in previous runs and unlike most people where they get butthurt, I actually take this criticism on board and I've decided to ban it. The AI in this game has no idea how to counter substitute and is way too over centralizing. You end up just abusing it every single time which is not fun and just gets really cheap after a while. There's also no reason for you not to use it, it just over centralizes your playthroughs. For example, Gardenia and Aaron to name a fraction of the boss battles, are completely trivialized with a substitute user and two brain cells to go with it. Now that is not allowed. You have to actually come up with different strategies and you have to actually prepare for your opponents being able to attack you now. But to make this even more insane, almost all setup strategies will be mostly removed from this Nuzlocke. Well, setup moves like Dragon Dance and Bulk Up aren't explicitly banned. I went out my way to severely limit their usage, and without Substitute or Baton Pass, this is not going to be easy to pull off anyways, you can't just set up the plus 6 and win, the AI won't let you do that anymore. I think throughout the insane amount of boss battles in this game, I only use setup moves in the grand total of like 4 or 5 of them out of the ridiculous amount of battles in this game, and even when I did use setup moves like Dragon Dance, which you will see me use once or twice, I added a rule where I am not allowed to boost any of my stats past two stages, making it fair and not abusable. 
I think when I did use Dragon Dance, I limited myself to only being able to go to plus one, and then I have to stop, so that's pretty fair. It's in no way broken, I'm not abusing it in any way. And in another battle, I did use Sword Stance once, and there was one battle in the post game where I used Nasty Plot once. This is pretty fair. I'm not like abusing the plus six, well the AI just can't do anything, like well setting up, you're still at risk of getting hurt by the AI. So that is something to consider. Also another thing to consider is that in this run, the AI themselves will be using setup moves a lot more frequently than you. All of these rules made this extra extreme Nuzlocke a crazy experience to remember. So enough about this, let me actually show you what I did. And yes, there will be a lot of variance now. I will also try to give some advice and some strategies on how you too would go about doing this, but because of the randomness, it might not be too helpful, it really depends. So start the run and pick your starter. This time this is a very important choice, as the starter that you get at the beginning of the game is the only free Pokemon you can get in the entire run. After this, there are no more free Pokemon, everything has to be encountered in the wild. Luckily this time they are pros and cons for all choices. The early game can be really rough and it will have quite a bit of variance depending on your encounters. It will vary quite a lot. Turtwig is arguably the least useful against the first gym because it doesn't evolve at level 16 but Barry 2 is by far the easiest with Turtwig as he'll have the Chimchar and at that point Chimchar is really easy to deal with. I argue that in the long run Empoleon is by far the best starter when evolved mainly because of its defensive typing, stats, and the Yawn Protect Leftovers combo which is incredibly useful. And it can put in quite a bit of work against Roark as a Primplup. However, if you pick Piplup dealing with Barry's level 11 Turtwig at the start of the game is a huge threat in Barry 2. But for this run, I chose Chimchar. It's pretty good against some of the early game bosses and is a solid choice albeit pretty frail. I get very lucky and in my first and only attempt of this run, I get a Chimchar with amazing IVs and Iron Fist which is very nice and pretty lucky. It's so good that it actually manages to win the very first battle against a rival's Piplup which has perfect IVs and that's really hard to do. If your Chimchar actually beats the Piplup in the first battle in this game, you know it's a very good one. So get access to the Pokeballs and this is where things really begin. Because of no gift Pokemon and the impending early game threats, the first few encounters are absolutely vital. It's extremely important that you catch everything you can and do not risk anything on your team. The randomness of not having any guaranteed gift Pokemon not only makes your available Pokemon much weaker, but also gives you a lot less mons to work with. Resource management is now a huge problem in this Nuzlocke, especially once you approach the end of the game and by god, it becomes a crippling issue in the post game if you even make it that far. In hindsight, I would have been extra careful of every single Pokemon as you will need almost every single Pokemon at some point. The end of this run got desperate for resources. Yes, even mons that you wouldn't normally ban I at would be needed at some point because you're just going to run out of mons eventually. This game, including post game, is very long so that will be an issue. I will say experiencing this game in this way is really unique, but also extra tense at the same time. So first catch this Nuzlocke is a Brave Nature Starly. Good, very strong, but the lack of speed might be an issue. Next is Surskit, and while it is underwhelming early game, Masquerine is very powerful in the early game also with Intimidate. It got stat buffs and pretty good move pool, so not bad. So yeah, don't pick up the free EV this time and make sure that you're decently leveled for the first Turtwig. Sweet, I encounter Rattata. This is so nice and it's got buff stats. With Guts or Hustle, it becomes a tremendous powerhouse and... Oh, for fuck's sake! Seriously, get used to me saying this, but by far my least favourite thing about this game is the pre-generation 6 critical hit system. So obnoxious, it adds so much RNG that's really hard to play around. Without weakening it, the Rattata could badly damage my Chimchar, especially with a Hustle critical hit, so it's a really hard risk either way, and my weaker Pokemon just would not be able to handle it, they would probably go down themselves. So my first failed encounter and extremely frustrating. 
by far the best early game encounter that you can get is Bidoof, simply because Bibarel got an amazing stat buff and it's incredibly useful early on especially against the first gym. Anyways, move on, and don't bother grinding my Starly as it won't be worth using until it's Draptor, so just leave it aside for now. The free egg from Job Life City is obviously not allowed this time. Now here I need to prepare for the first real rival battle. The main thing I need to counter is the Piplup as it now has Water Pulse which is quite threatening. I'll need some more Mons for that. So I get the Old Rod and I start to encounter all the available routes to get my catches from them. First I get a Finneon, then backtrack and get a Krabby and a Poliwag from Twinleaf Town. Then the last two encounters are Caterpie, which is surprisingly good in this run. Butterfree got buffed and Compound Eye Sleep Powder is really good. Then finally for my last encounter before the arrival I get a Zubat, though it was Tib in nature with minimum attack IVs, so special Crobat I guess, it's, it's actually not that bad, it ends up being really useful later on. So prep for the next boss battle and face Barry. Krabby is by far the best lead. Rock Tomb allows it to easily beat down the Starly and will more often than not beat down the next Munchlax as well, so you only have to worry about the final Piplop. However, this was a massive pain in the ass. I just can't damage it that much and I got some really annoying confusion RNG. And here is my first casualty of the run. I miss Hypnosis and take a critical hit. Yup, it had to happen, of course. Losing another Monus early is bad but I've got to keep it together and play better from here on. The next encounter after the Barry battle is a Cubone which did almost literally nothing in this run. It is good against the first gym leader but there's so many better things to encounter here. Definitely look out for all the trainer battles, take no risks. What I do is I assume early game that every hit will be a critical hit. If you do that you should be fine. Evolve my Monferno and Butterfree. The great thing is that Butterfree now, it gets access to Hidden Power Fighting, which hits rock types really hard so that's very nice to have. Now, Orbra Gate encounter can be vital. I go to the bottom floor to get my encounter there as I think there are better chances of getting a good Mon down there. What you really want to see is a Ryolu. Oh god, if you see that and actually manage to catch that for your encounter, consider yourself lucky. Definitely evolve it into Lucario as soon as possible, preferably before the first gym, it's so incredibly powerful early game. But my first encounter was a Geodude. I see a Riolu is my next encounter after that which made me kind of salty as I obviously couldn't catch that but oh well. Geodude will be useful soon regardless so it's not the worst thing. Last two encounters before the first gym are Matchup and Aaron so now I need to prepare for the first gym, which is going to be very tense without the surefire marsh top method to just carry me through it without any effort. I was having some difficulty coming up with a reliable method to cheese rework. Do you note for this run that I do not look up any boss battles in advance to facing them. I don't like doing this and I feel like it cheapens the experience, almost like cheating in a way. Any information that I do have for the boss battles in this game is based on my own recollection from my previous Nuzlocke attempts from like almost a year ago. I don't know exact damage calculations or what items, exact movesets or natures each boss's Pokemon will have. I only know some of this. Exploiting guys to get an advantage in this way is like playing Yu-Gi-Oh and flat out looking at your opponent's hand and winning because of that. It arguably takes away skill and just makes it so you can exploit the AI really well. Like yeah if you play good and look up every boss battle from Radical Red, you can Nuzlocke Pokemon Radical Red by coming up with extremely specific counter strategies to exploit their teams. But it does feel unfair and a bit too convenient. It basically spoils everything for you, removing the fun. See, I don't do Nuzlocke's to measure my ECOC. I do it for fun. This is why I retroactively realised that Emerald Kaizo was a stupid bad game this whole time. I never enjoyed it in the first place. This is why I do post games in Nuzlocke's when most people don't think they count in Nuzlocke's. I like them. When you do a challenge that's hard but truly enjoyable you have fun with it and as you become more passionate with it you really want to get better and improve at it and not just do some stupid challenge that's purely hard for the sake of being hard. 
Anyways, clear all the trainers in Rourke's gym. That tangent aside, something crazy did happen while I was pondering my strategy for the first gym. I encountered a shiny fampy. Yes! Now this is more like it. And as for shiny claws, shinies will be allowed but if they get out of hand I will stop allowing them in this run. I made a rule of thumb so I could only catch like 3 shinies in this run to prevent abuse as I know you can get quite a bit of shinies. But this wasn't an issue regardless as I only encountered 3 shinies in this run anyways while grinding. I didn't go out my way to farm for anything in particular, the shinies were all completely random so allowing 3 random shiny whale pokemon is more than fair considering all of my huge restrictions. You can get 11 very powerful gift pokemon before the first gym so yeah it's totally fair at this point. But this one shiny fampy is exactly what I need to choose a first gym leader. With his really good physical stats in a strategy that someone on Pokemon Challenges Discord randomly suggested before I started this Nuzlocke. I just remembered it out of nowhere and just had an epiphany. Now I have a way to destroy Roark easily. Other amazing Pokemon for the first gym that you can get include Roselia, Sunflora, Ludicolo and the Barrel. But I grinded my team and challenged the first gym leader at the appropriate level cap. Now, behold my masterful strategy. These were so satisfying to pull off, such tactical manoeuvres in battle truly make me feel like Caesar at the Battle of Alessia when he set up his cavalry to plus 6 attack to sweep the gods at the very end to win with them. Anyways, start the battle, lead off with Butterfree, a new sleep powder with compound eyes. There is about a 2% chance of missing but the payoff is well worth it. This allows Fampy to come in and wreck Nosepass while setting up one defense curl. I easily could have gone plus 6 defense as I realized that Nosepass literally cannot touch Fampy with anything but I didn't want to abuse setup because I'm honorable I guess. So I just spam Bulldoze after one defense curl and put in a lot of work. Oh, the tank. I do know that Nosepass is Thunder Wave so that was one thing I did prepare for with Fampy. Even Kranidos gets tanked and chewed up, so be very careful of getting hit by critical hits. Also I do recommend the Expert Belt for this. The ending got tense as I don't want to lose my Fampy so I had no choice but to sacrifice my Finneon instead. The one casualty was unfortunate but it was totally worth it for the win in the end. So awesome start. Moving on, look out for this trainer who has a Krikatoon. And now I've got 3 more characters before the next boss battle. While spamming the honey trees can be a great strat to get Munchlax, I choose not to do that this time. Oh no, another casualty this time. I lost Krabby the Galactic Double Battle which was definitely annoying but at least Krabby isn't that useful anyways. It's good to specifically use your less useful Pokemon as decoys for your more valuable ones, especially for the late game. Anyways, my first encounter I get before Mars is... Oh. My. God. Shroomish. Now, I know that this thing has a lot of sauce, but good god, I was not prepared for how impactful this thing would become. Basically, it ends up being near Gyarados levels of overpoweredness without the need for any boosting moves or substitute, which is ludicrous. So good, and good god, do not risk this anytime soon. Keep it safe in the PC. Next encounter was this thing. Now, I know, I know, this thing doesn't look good. Man, I feel crazy just telling you guys about this, but what if I told you that this Pachirisu would become one of the most impactful Pokemon of this entire run? Yes, I'm just as incredulous as you are in hindsight. Though early game, you can't deny the sauce as Pachirisu did get a nice stat buff. Last encounter before the next boss fight was Apom. Meh. So, Mars is here and now I've got a plan to easily destroy her. Pachirisu can easily wreck Mars' two flying types and I brought Geodude specifically to counter the Progly. Though it isn't that good in this run because I can't get leftovers at this point in the game without the EV to use Covet. Expert Belt, Mild Nature Pachirisu. Rex Yanma in Geodude chips away the Perugly enough so Monferno can come in and give it a knuckle sandwich. Lel. Now is the time to evolve Zubat. 
which I make extra sure to use a soothe bell at all times, you want to get a crowbat as soon as possible. I battled Cheryl next, though this battle was easy for the most part. Except for this little thing that happened. Butterfree can sleep out of this thing. I was thinking of having this lead Butterfree to counter guard Danios. It will be very useful later on in the- oh! In t What? The- Fuck. Are you kidding me? What the hell? Oh man. I needed this thing. This was just so random and out of nowhere. I was legit so tilted from this. My easy cheese stat for Gardenia is now gone. Go keep it together, Ding Dong. However, my run is still going pretty well, I will say, all things considered. There was this instance where I could have gone KO'd as I didn't have a switch in, but luckily, I didn't. Well, that was pretty good at least. And now my search kit has evolved to mass screen, it can put in a good amount of work. I go to Eterna City for the encounter there, next to the forest. I didn't want to do the double battle with Cheryl's my encounter as that can be really annoying, so I used repels to get past the forest without getting any encounters there. So the next encounter after the forest is a wild marrow and oh baby, this is superb. And it has huge power. But it's got a quiet nature and awful attack IVs. Hmm, well. It is still really good, all things considered. Hell, even special attacking Azumarill is good in this game now, as its bulk and typing alone makes it very valuable, so overall, still a win. Now I backtrack to a turn of force to get my encounter there, and I encounter a Buniri, and this is good. Low Pony is powerful this time around, but I can't be bothered grinding friendship right now, I'll use it later on. I go to the Shadow now and have my encounter. And yes, this time Rotom is not allowed, so I have to actually encounter something random. I want to ban all static encounters, as I want all the encounters to be like a surprise. This ensures that all my strategies are not predetermined, and shows that I can nuzzle up this game without relying on a few really broken Pokemon to carry me, like Legendaries or Rotom. I encountered a Radgate, which I guess it's poetic justice for what happened earlier on, it does have guts, so... This thing is potentially a powerhouse, so that's a pretty nice encounter, though I won't be risking it right now. Now, Gardenia will be a threat, so preparation is vital. Get the rest of the encounters. In the city, I fish up a Trichini, Brave Nature, and it'll be very powerful later on. I also get a Brave Nature Meditite. Not bad. And for Mount Coronet, now, I know that if you use your encounter to use the old rod in there, I believe that Feebas is a guaranteed encounter, and man did it carry me in my last Nuzlocke that I did of this game. But this time, I wanted to avoid using it this time for an added challenge. It's interesting not knowing exactly what I'll encounter, it's kind of like it puts you on edge. However, there is some actual reasoning behind this decision. I know that Gardenia's Roserade is a massive threat and has virtually no counters, except for Metang and Snorlax at this point of the game. The first is a gift Pokemon, and the second is very hard to encounter at this point. I do know that Beldum is a free gift Pokemon, so I can't get that, but Beldum is also an encounter in this cave. I take a well chance to encounter one, as I will really want one to out the Roserade, and I encounter it on the second try. The first encounter and proper one was a Nose Pass. Not what I was hoping for. This rock type won't be helping me at all against Gardenia. Oh man, I might be in trouble for that boss battle. I am salty about not getting Beldum. Now what do I do? My last encounter before Gardenia is a Snowverge is not very good. I can maybe use it as fodder or something. Beat all the trainers before the gym, but be very careful and make sure that your mons are decently leveled. They are not to be taken lightly, especially the trainers in the snow area. They can be very tough and can easily kill some of your Pokemon. A good strategy is to bring mons like Donphan that I know I won't be needing for the second gym, so I'm okay if they accidentally pass the level cap as they won't be needed anyways. But wait, as I'm beating these trainers I just realised something. Nose Pass can evolve. Like right now. Yes that's right and oh my god. This is exactly what I needed. Steel typing, quiet nature, 
a buff to its special attack stat and great special defense IVs. This is absolutely fantastic and is exactly what I need to handle the Rosa Raid. Yes! Man, the Snow Trainers can be scary, my Breloom was in critical hit range. Yikes. Spore is a beatable thing. Make sure to heal up for all of these trainers and take no risks if possible. But now that I have cleared them all without any losses, I prepare for the next gym. First, now that I've got TM Thief, I can go back and steal some leftovers from Weld Munchlaxes. Very useful. And I get Crobat at level 26, which is very convenient. Now it's Gardenia time, and I know for a fact that with TM Substitute, this fight is an absolute joke. So abusable. The AI just does not know how to deal with it. But without Substitute, this fight can be a real threat this time. The lead Blossom is Stunspore, and her Rosaried is a monster, but I've got a plan for this. I lead off with Breloom, and make sure that it's already poisoned. I originally thought that Technician was a better ability than Poison Heal, but man, I was so wrong, and I am glad to be wrong there. Coupled with Leftovers, the recovery is insane, along with the immunity to Blossom's Dunspore. Easily play around it by switching out, then switch back in predicting the Dunspore to finish off the lead Blossom. Now the real fight begins, and this is where my tactical brilliance comes into play. I know even grass moves from Roserade will hurt Probo Pass as Roserade is so strong, but I knew that it would go for a poison move so I can get a free switch into my Probo Pass so it doesn't take any damage, giving it enough time to paralyze its threat, almost neutralizing it. Though Magical Leaf is still a big problem, I can't chip it enough so Monferno can switch in into a resisted hit and finish it off with Flame Wheel. If Crobat was physical, then that would have probably been a better choice, but it's a special attack on Crobat, so no. Cherim kindly sets up the sun for me, and even gets burned, negating its sash. But I had Mac Punch ready regardless of that situation anyways, and Gardenia had already used her super potion, so the burn didn't really matter. See, I'm always two steps ahead. Brelum can easily be Grottle, but is running out of PP, so Masquerade can come in and destroy it along with the rest of her team with its really impressive special attack and its strong signal beam. So that was pretty good, very smooth all things considered. Afterwards, be very careful of this one Galactic Grunt, who has a Aridos and Ledian, as they got mutual buffed. Now it's Jupiter time and her main threat on her team is her Skunk Tag. That thing is a nasty crit machine, but I came up with a plan to beat her easily enough. Pachirisu shows its worth on my team by one-shotting Golbat and hitting the Skunk Tank pretty hard and paralyzing it. Damn. Allowing Donphan to come in and whip it. Masquerade then wrecks the Tangela and Donphan cleans up the Sableye. This boss battle was unusually smooth. Nice to see the RNG is working out in my favor this time, so that's really nice. Yo, this hiker here has self-destruct, so don't be about that nonsense. Time for the Mirror boss fight, and this was... Something. This is one of the most ludicrous boss fights I have ever had in a Nuzlocke ever. I am being fucking real with you. But first, before that boss fight, I encounter a Stunky. That is very good as you will see pretty soon. And in the cave area where Mira is, I don't allow myself to catch the Gabite as that's a stacking encounter, though it would have been really good to get. The main thing to worry about is the Aaron fight which will be coming up. That's the real big threat in this run. I just need to make it to Silesian Town in good enough condition. That's like the starting goal of the Nuzlocke in this game. Silesian Town is like getting the Lord Vessel in Dark Souls. It's like reaching Majula for the first time in Dark Souls 2. It's a vitally important hub area and you need to reach it with your best Pokemon still intact ideally. So, before I can get there, I face Mira and the battle against her started off super well. Pachirisu is swinging, swinging and swinging, knocks out her Pokemon, but then the final Porygon 2 came out. Now, I know that this thing is dumb, but good lord, just watching over this footage gives me serious anxiety, I'm not joking. It copies Volt Absorb, so Pachirisu can barely touch it anymore. I even miss Sweet Kiss. 
switching pull pass to tank the tri attack. But it gets frozen. All of a sudden, things really started to go against me and I started to panic. Porikos was getting charge beam special attack boosts, I was taking damage even going into critical hit range. Pull pass was not defrosting. The confusion that I got in it wasn't doing very much. I panicked and made some bad decisions. I did not want to lose anyone on my team and took a gut wrenching risk to send in Breloom and thankfully it did not get hit by critical hit but it got paralysed. The thought of losing my Breloom here in hindsight really gives me anxiety after realising how vital a player Breloom will be in the long run and the paralysis was just so obnoxious. Oh man, I've got no choice but to sack something to switch in safely. No, I refuse to let the stupid bitch have her way with me with this stupid fucking RNG. I need time to stall, wait for an opening, abuse the AI's linearity and lack of prediction to stall and heal up Pachirisu. What I could do is predict tri attack, switch and pull pass, take almost no damage, then predict charge beam, switch back in Pachirisu and heal myself up. I can stall a bit with that strategy. But wait! Porygon 2 is not using tri attack anymore. Holy cock. Holy cum. Holy jizz. I PB stalled it out. I can do this now. Don't give up. Keep memeing. Yikes, risk Crobat. Crobat is really holding on by Fred here and... Ah. Finally. Woo. Fuck you and your stupid shenanigans, you little bitch. Get shrekt. This is the most absurd battle I have ever had in a Nuzlocke. Never have I seen this level of shenanigans on both sides. This was so unbelievably stressful that the idea that I could have easily lost my Breloom still stresses me out to this day. I feel so lucky. I honestly probably should have sacked them on to have Breloom switching safely in use Spore, but at the same time, it is more than enough karma for all the bad RNG that I've had up until now. After this battle, I felt genuinely grateful and lucky for being around in this run later on because of this battle. It could have went horribly wrong, but it didn't, and I am grateful for that. So with that massive victory, it's time to reach Aaron in Slacian Town. Dawn's my first obstacle, and though she's not too bad. Masquerine beats lead Pillow Swine. Probo Pass and Masquerine can then be the next Clefable. Grotto was a surprising threat and I had to risk my Masquerine, but due to having Overgrow, it unfortunately knocks out my Masquerine. Drats. That's not very good, but I'm in no position to complain anyways to be honest. Pachirisu can just finish it off. And for the final Lopunny threat, I brought Azumarill just to beat Lopunny, which it did very well. So now it's time to prepare for the epic Aaron battle, which is nerve wracking. The main threat on this team is that Drapion, which is an absolute RNG monster. I catch the Vipers in my last encounter before that boss battle, and after grinding my team, it's do or die. So the clash begins with Aaron, and I do have a strategy to win. With Substitute, this battle can be easily cheesed, but without Substitute, you have to be very diligent to avoid casualties. Luckily, Probopass is almost the perfect lead here. Dustox literally cannot damage it, so it's a free KO and Stealth Rocks that are set up to break Sashes and damage the bug types. This combined with Probopass's really good special attack stat allows it to one-shot the following Beauty Fly and Venomoth, which is very impressive, while also walling them pretty well. The second last Scizor is a threat, but this is why you bring a fire type to counter it. Now all that's left is the beast, and I've got to counter it somehow. It has to be Dawn Fan. It came to me as a free shiny, so it has to earn the right to remain in my presence. And impressively, Dawn Fan takes 2 plus 2 hits and beats Aaron without getting sniped by that Drapion. Well done indeed. What a relief. The end of the first journey is almost upon me. Two more boss battles to go. Fintima looks much easier in comparison to Aaron, but she still has some threats to be wary of. Watch out for the trainers in her gym as 
they can be pretty threatening. This one crit here might have mattered. So I think I have a plan for Fantima. I prepare Breloom, along with the rest of my new team which I made just for her. Then I go to beat her. Lead the third gym battle with Pachirisu which can two shot the Driftblim without taking any damage. Though the fact that it was at plus 3 was scary as it has Baton Pass also with Unburden I think. Wait, shouldn't Baton Pass be banned? Man. But despite getting a power hacks, Pachirisu beating the Driftblim is a very likely outcome as you have a 72.5% chance to either paralyze the Driftblim or get a critical hit with two discharges, so it's a pretty good matchup regardless of the power hacks. Great start. Dusclops is next, and this is where I unleash my trump card. Leftovers Toxic Heal Breloom that can't be burned restores 18% of its HP each turn and can outspeed half of your team. Incredible. I do use two bulk ups and yes, this is one of the very few battles in the entire Nuzlocke where I do use setup moves but I only use two bulk ups. It's not broken on Breloom as I'm not abusing substitute or anything so it's not a big deal. Gengar is a threat and Crobat can switch in and two shot it. Though if I had a better nature and better attack IVs along with an expert belt, Crobat would definitely be able to one shot the Gengar. But it didn't matter regardless. Miss Magius was a real threat though and I was preparing for this. I came up with something. Skunk Tank can come in and destroy it with Shadow Claw as it's now a fairy type so Night Slash won't be super effective anymore. Skunk Tank in this game got a pretty nice HP buff to make it better. Now after Miss Magius is down, Breloom can sweep the rest. There was one critical hit range which is very tense but I win regardless, with no losses. That was a pretty smooth battle I got to say. Almost there. Beat Rival 3 with only slight difficulty. For now I'll gloss over this fight as he's not a very big deal, yet. Now the big boss battle is upon me. I have to get past this without casualties and it's no joke. Luckily Barry has 4 Pokemon to back me up and Skuntank can counter this boss battle pretty well. I also leveled up a bit more as the level cap is now level 39 so I might as well give myself the best chance of reaching Sloisian Town in one piece. Can you believe that in literally this entire battle, I won by only taking one single attack? Damn. Now that all the bosses are cleared, I'm free to ascend to Slacian Town, but first, my reward. I get a few more encounters from new areas, Iglybuff, Smeargle which goes straight to the bucket, and Snubble. Now, I am finally here, at my safe haven. Oh man, it feels so good to be here, so good. On one hand, the worst is over, but at the same time the worst is actually still to come, but at least now. I have the means to EV train and customise my team however I see fit, giving me control over my own fate and allowing me to better leverage my brain. With the power of my cranium and my semi-broken Pokemon, the real Nuzlocke challenge begins. Catch Miltank in the next route and a Lickitung from the route afterwards, and I begin to clear a path to the next gym leader. I primarily use my Skuntank as I won't be needing that for the next gym leader anyway so I'm fine if that accidentally reaches the level cap. Some of these trainers though, I did underestimate and they were not to be taken lightly. Good lord, this battle here was a shock to me. Way too close for comfort. But at the very least after that, every trainer until Maylene is dealt with so all that's left to do is to go past Veiltone City to get my encounter there. I get Rhyhorns by encounter, which is pretty nice but this is where the real Nuzlocke begins. I need to prepare an EV train team specially designed to counter Maylene. Hmm, I don't actually recall her whole team, I know some of her moves and some of her strategies but not all of them so there will be some guesswork required. So I do my training and 
I come up with a team that should be good enough. Now that I've finished training, it's time to get my fourth gym badge. But, that concludes this episode. Next time on Ding Dong Games. With the first major part of the challenge out of the way, there's so many more hardships yet to come. But this is where I shine with my galaxy brain. I can handle everything this game throws at me. Damn right. Hmm, that's scary. But the stakes start to raise astronomically as the pressure mounts. Can my nuzlocking skills stand up to this challenge? Find out in the next episode of Ding Dong Games.